All right, folks. Thanks for joining us. This is the next talk lineup in track two. Uh, Justin Henderson will be giving us a talk on building a home lab as well as building a hobby farm. So Justin, it is now in your capable hands and we'll uh, go from there. All right, thank you very much. So to be clear, I, I'm starting about building a home lab and more, more about why it matters than about the actual how-to. That being said, I, I need to be sharing some resources and references on what you can do to build it out, but there's a lot of misconception on what a home lab is for. I think we tend to think it's like, you have to have passion for a home lab or, you know, it's only for those elitists, those, you know, show and tell and bragging rights and we'll get into all that. So I'll start with that. And then my, my second half is gonna be on hobby farm which I'm literally sitting in a barn right now because that's that's my office. <laughs> and I'm surrounded by 16 and a half acres of land, tons of animals. So when I say hobby farm, in case you're wondering what that means, I'm not dealing with plants. That's cool too. I love, I love planting personally, but uh, my hobby farm is animals. And one day I hope to retire and actually do like a, a little kid's petting zoo or something. So we'll go through, you know, what, what could you do to maybe start this and uh, join me? <laughs> so with that, uh, my name's Justin Henderson. So I've been in InfoSec for, I wanna say close to 20 years at this point. I've been doing consulting jobs since I was 13, but actually go around and do like uh, Active Directory installations. What's this? Patch management, sorry, Windows Server Update Service. Uh, we would do Pixie Boot workstations. And when I say we, it's because I partnered with my brother. He's three years older. So we made some pretty decent money back then. I have 61 certifications and I'm, I'm drawing attention to this because I don't know if it's about certs. And clearly I like certs. I got a lot, but with 61 certs, I got to say most of my knowledge and training didn't come from studying for those certs. I think they've helped me get like job interviews. And I think certs are a good thing, but Part of this talk is we have to figure out where to draw the line in the sand and we need to get you some jobs and or maybe get you some promotions or I want to figure out what makes you tick and what you want and I want to help you get there. So on that note too, you know, I love hobby farms. I love InfoSec. I love the two parallels. Uh, I do a lot of open source projects. I've got a GitHub full of stuff and talks and so anyway, th that's me. I'm also a GSE and, you know, SANS author, instructor. I own my own business, blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's move on to the cool stuff. So let's start right out of the gate with, with this problem I'm trying to identify. Why, why a home lab? Like, why do you need to take time out of your busy schedule from your family, from all these things that matter to your hobbies, right, to build a home lab? Is, is that even fair that there's even a potential for expectation? And I, I wanna share the flip side of this for a second. I have interviewed hundreds of individuals. I own my own company, so I've hired folks. Back before I owned my own company, I was a, um, a systems and security architect and I interviewed a lot of people for the team I was managing. And there's this, there's this problem, and I literally just went through this last week. I put a, a interview, I put a thing out for a new position with my company, and within one day we had 50 plus applications, and we're starting to call them, and it's the same old experience that looks like this. Resume looks pretty good. You've got you know a couple of years of experience. You've got a bachelor's, a master, sometimes even PhDs. You've got at the bottom of the resume, all these different skills. You've got Active Directory, you know how to do network security monitoring, you have you know, all these different tools, Splunk listed out and some certifications as well. In fact, now, today, compared to say uh, five, 10 years ago, you probably have twice the amount of certifications that I used to see. And so there's a trend towards certifications, there's a trend towards college, but there's one trend that has stayed the same throughout all of this. When I start asking questions and I'm, I'm not trying to be mean at all, I'm just like, okay, I, I see you put that you've done this at college or it's in your skill section. How does that thing work? 
Oh, well, um, uh, and there's a struggle to answer the question. And if you put it on your resume, it's, it's fair game. <laughs> I get to ask you. And I'm not trying to make people fail because really I'm not trying to hire, this is kind of crazy. I'm not trying to hire expertise. I'm trying to figure out what makes you tick, how quickly you can learn, where you've applied yourself. And to be honest, I found that I actually have better results with folks with associate's degree than four year plus degrees. Because there's a difference between theory and information and actually doing work. It, it almost makes me kind of wonder, like we've gone to this day and age where we go so much towards information that I almost feel like we need to trend backwards towards the concept of like apprenticeships. That's, that's my opinion, please, you know, don't nail me to the wall. <laughs> uh, I'm giving this talk because I wanna help you stand out. I don't wanna waste your time. I don't wanna go through all these things, but when I get in an interview and I talk to someone and they're like, yeah, I've done that in a lab. And I don't care whether that's your lab or if you work for a company that hopefully gives you some lab time, which is just pretty rare. For my employees, I try to give them like a half a day on Fridays and they jump into a lab and they just get to learn new things. And it's, it's a de-stressor. It helps increase like productivity, actually. That's pretty uncommon though. But when I start to talk about home lab, people actually get upset. I'm doing a huge YouTube series that's gonna be like 20 to 30 clips long, like ranging from 15 minutes to an hour. And it's free, I'm not charging for it, but I've gotten a lot of like hate mail. <laughs> people are reaching out to me and like the comments at the bottom of the slide, like employers should not expect me to invest in a lab on my time or I'll be caught dead wasting my evening or putting my money to work building out a home lab, that, that's unfair, it shouldn't be expected. And, or my favorite one, asking about if someone has a home lab is a form of gatekeeping. And I, I, I get this a lot. And so when I'm doing free videos on building a home lab, it, it kind of makes me feel not dirty because I believe in what I'm doing, but it makes me feel like people don't like me and then I want to cry. <laughs> Because I think there's a misperception here that, you know, people with labs are they're bragging about their half rack or full server rack. And quite frankly, some people who have really extensive labs, they're they're kind of cocky. They're, they're, they brag all the time. They're proud, but not in a good way. And it ends up being this conception of elitism. And then we start to think, well, wow, in order to have a lab, I need tons of time. I need tons of money because I got to buy all that equipment and I better have some passion to maintain that all. And that's not what a home lab is about. Like you don't even have to be passionate. Like if you are in this and you're building out a home lab, you might not necessarily even like IT, but what are you trying to do then? I'm trying to get a job? I'm trying to put food on the table. And so I want to change this conception on why you should do a lab. And really, you should ask your employer, if you, if you have an employer right now, can I have 30 minutes or an hour on one day a week to do a lab? And maybe would you help buy some of the software or hardware if you even need it? It's not about building a home lab. It's about sending a message. It's about standing out from the crowd. It's about, you know, well, why did you spend so much money to go to college? Like really, like people are leaving IT colleges and they have tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Why would you do that? And think of all the time that goes into that. Well, well, Justin, I, I want a job. So why do you go to college? To get a job. But if everybody goes to college and everybody applies, what makes me want to hire you versus everybody else that went to college? Because most people in their resumes, they went to college. Okay, no problem. I'll get some certifications. Okay, so why do you get certifications? It's to stand out. It's to help get a job. But here's the problem. And feel free to call me out on this because I'm comfortable saying this. I have 61 certifications. I know for a fact how much I actually grew and learned studying for those certs. Now, some of them, absolutely, I learned a ton. Like, 
the GSE was a lot of work and it forced me to do a lot of hands-on labs because that was part of the cert. And some of these, I can pick up a book because I went to college at WGU and it was self-paced. So rather than doing traditional learning, I was buying a book from Amazon, reading through it, taking a certification exam once a week. And anytime I passed the exam, I passed the class. So I was financially motivated to go boom, boom, boom. But I didn't learn a lot of applicable direct experience from a lot of that. <laughs> so then I know and employers know when they see those certs, it means you know the minimum bar to pass it, which doesn't always mean you can actually do that thing. You could have the Security Plus, the CISSP, you could have Microsoft certified security expert specializations, and that doesn't mean you know how to roll your own PKI and do IPsec and do NAC and, well, but I did pass the exam. So a home lab to me, one of the major points is to get you a job, to get you to stand out. Because once you start getting interviewed and when I interview folks and they're like, oh yeah, I've done that in a lab. I'm not maybe like a super expert, but I'm familiar with Active Directory. I'm familiar with Security Onion. Like it's not, otherwise it's like this. Oh yeah, I've heard about that all the time. And we learned about that in school and my past employer did that, but I didn't, I wasn't the one driving. But as soon as I interview someone like, oh yeah, I've done that. And they usually will say, well, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in this, but I'm familiar, then it's like, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I want. And I want that for you because I want to help you get a job or a promotion or whatever reason you're doing it. Maybe it's just for fun because you're passionate, but it doesn't have to be the reason. So then from there, what do you need? This is probably the biggest misconception. We think a home lab means you got to buy Cisco switches and you got to buy a firewall and you got to get all this different interface and you know, go on eBay, buy some servers, actually get rack mounted. No, no. <laughs> All you need is the computer you're watching this on right now. You load up a little bit of virtualization software and so to build out this lab, it could be free. This is one of the areas I've also gotten a lot of hate mail because I have a YouTube video showing all the possible home lab equipment you might want. But let's be clear, they're wants, they're not needs. You know, if you want a Cisco switch, go for it, but you can emulate it in software and you can get a free trial and learn how to use it. So don't, don't, don't overthink it. From here, you take your laptop, your desktop, whatever you have, find a computer that a company's thrown in the trash can or ask them if they're, you know, can I do a, a DOD software wipe of the hard drives or can I have it without the hard drive and repurpose a the box. There's a lot of free virtualization, virtual box. I personally prefer VMware Workstation and I'll pay the, you know, whatever the license costs one time so that I can have that. But VirtualBox is almost the same thing. Docker and Kubernetes, I'm sure you've heard about them. They're a little intimidating. $20 class on Udemy and it'll show you how to get started with those technologies. Now you're deploying Nginx web servers and web application firewalls and databases and it was free, completely free. Now, if you're on Windows 10, you could do Hyper-V. I'm not a huge fan of that, but you know what? It works just fine for building on lab. Proxmark, Proxmox, sorry, Proxmark's a different thing. Proxmox, if you have dedicated hardware that you can do a hypervisor install, especially even if like you have three, you can do like software RAID SAN. It's not really SAN, it's hyper-converged. And you can learn what that means and how to deploy it with just some cheap old desktops lying around. There's free ISOs you can download for Microsoft to get server licenses. Cloud, Amazon, and Azure will give you some free credits. And there's tons of other ways for low cost to get started. So what do you do with this then, right? You figure out first why you wanna build a lab, what motivates you, could be money, right? And then you start to build things out. And there's a huge list of things. If, and then maybe that's what's intimidating. Like, I'm, not, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. <laughs> the longer I'm in security, the dumber I feel. 
I have no problem saying that because the more I learn, the more I know I don't know. And that's scary. But I think if we can come out and say that, and this group, PancakesCon, and all the talkers and attendees, this is a good group of people that we've kind of shrugged that off and we've come together. And as we do that, we lift each other up. It doesn't have to be all huggy, touchy, feely, but we're here for you and I'm glad you made it. So if I have this huge list of things and oh my gosh, like Active Directory, Windows Event Forwarding, Web Servers, uh, NSM, SIM, DNS, DHCP, Packet Capture, Malware, like I can go on and on and I didn't have enough slide space to even list like some of the things I'm gonna be covering on YouTube. Oh my gosh, that's so much stuff. Yeah, you know what? I've interviewed hundreds of people and I bet if I were to ask, hey, have you done this bullet in the lab? The max I would probably get is like five bullets. And it probably would only be, you know, two to three percent of the people I interview. And so if you want to be a diamond in the rough, it might just be play with a few of these. Okay. You don't have to do all of them. I've literally gone through and done all these, but that's because I do consulting and it directly turns into money because then I can turn around and do them for companies. That was my motivation. It wasn't just because I thought it was cool. Some of these is, yeah, I thought it was cool, but then ultimately it turned into consulting anyway. So if you're just starting, what I would actually pick are things that are either so broad that everybody has them, Active Directory. So great for anybody to play with. Or do something that's specific, fun, easy with lots of documentation. So like these are some projects that there's a whole lot of online articles. You can Google, you know, DuckDuckGo this and Security Onion. Here's the download link. Here's how to get it up and running. And now you have SIM and NSM, even though you might not know what the individual components do. Part of a lab, try to figure out what those individual components do. Doesn't have to be at an expert level. And the fact that you've got some of these up and running and you've maybe played with tuning them, that's an amazing feat. Polar proxy, what the heck is that? That's where you crack open TLS and uh, TLS uh, sessions. Like I reach out to Google, I reach out to um, you know YouTube and all the their HTTPS. And if you're running things like Wireshark or network security monitoring, you can't see the payload. But if on my lab I put Polar Proxy in the middle, all of a sudden I can, and I can do packet captures and all like Snort, Suricata and if I can even get that working and I say, hey, I, I've done SSL inspection with Polar Proxy, they're going to be like, what? You've done that before? What did that look like? That's cool. Plus, you know, for those of you who are monitoring your kids, it's pretty interesting. P of Sense, free open source firewall. You can do it on hardware or a virtual machine, and you're just goofing off with application control and web proxy and PyHole. You get a whole bunch of ads. Block them with pie hole. It's basically DNS sync holding. It's easy, simple, and fun. And that's that's where you want to kind of start is where things kind of straddle that line of hobby versus career. Raspberry Pis, you can buy like an $8 Raspberry Pi, like a, a Pi Zero W. Slow as molasses. <laughs> but it works. It works. It's cheap. Like you can show your kids like, hey, Here's this, you know, $8 computer. I want you to learn how to stand up a, an Nginx web server and don't tell them that it was only $10 <laughs> or $8, right? Let them learn and have like that, uh, you know, father, son, father, daughter, or mother, son, mother, daughter experience if, if they're interested. My kids, they're not interested in computers, but they think it's hilarious when I can control light bulbs or their little Lego robotics with these and to be honest i'm not that interested in robotics but i love the fact that they are so it it kind of bonds us together and there's guides on how to deploy some of this like palantar the windows event forwarding can be really intimidating with lots of settings and they've got tons of documentation and walkthrough and start with things that you can actually follow and there's one thing you're going to get out of this that i think is so important and that's when you go into IT, anything in IT, especially InfoSec, we have this issue of, 
I don't know what I like. I don't know what I want to do. And well, I'm in cyber defense. I'm biased. I, I, I think cyber defense is awesome. It's the best. And so the videos I usually do are around cyber defense. But there's specialties off cyber defense. And maybe you don't like cyber defense. Maybe you'd rather be like a forensicator, an auditor. Maybe you want to do red team or pen test. And I don't care because what matters is that you've dabbled, you've goofed off in a lab until you're like, that, that was cool. That, that's something I might want to do to earn an income. Or maybe I, I'm doing something right now, but I don't really like it. And again, you don't have to be super passionate. Like I love my job. I'm very fortunate. I thank God for that. But maybe you don't, and that's fine. So just pick whatever's the least evil that helps you make the income for you or your family. And a home lab is one of the number one ways to help you figure that out. So where do you start? <laughs> this was a, a, a live stream I did uh, and actually take this screen and like multiply it by four because I had to go to the left, to the right and up and down. And you can probably see in the background, I've got like some whiteboards over there. And we were just on a live stream. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna walk through how to stand up a home lab and I'm gonna, anything we draw, I will make a video on. But it was a live stream, so I was like, so if there's something I'm leaving out that you think we should cover, let's do it. And it's supposed to be an hour, we went an hour and 15 minutes, and you can see my handwriting here is horrendous. <laughs> but we did like all sorts of on-prem things, web proxies, we went into cloud, terraforming, and you know, uh, hypervisors, virtualization platforms, we did uh, data center controls on a different screen, and that's intimidating. That, that's a ton of stuff, and it took me a long time to learn all that, and you don't need to learn all of that. But if I'm trying to get into a home lab, which of these boxes or circles or chicken scratch do you recommend? Well, again, my goal for you is to probably dabble enough to be scary, play around with, and figure out what you like the most out of the things you played with. Do a little bit of forensics, do a little bit of, of offense, pen test, red teaming, play with scripting, PowerShell, Python. And in what I'm trying to do, and my promise to you is all of those items that I've had bullet points on here, I'm going to, over the next 20 to 30 weeks, I'm going to YouTube them all out. Free, no cost. So what I would recommend, and this is a, I'd say it's self-interest, but I don't make any money off of this, but Subscribe to youtube.com slash HA Security Solutions if any of this stuff about a home lab makes sense to you. Now, I'm not saying I'm the only source of home lab guides. Please feel free, find other ones. There's ones on Pluralsight. Medium.com has plenty of really good documentation. But I'm going to hit it hard from the ground up, from hardware recommendations, all you really need is a laptop to virtualization, whether it's a hypervisor or software on top of your laptop or desktop. And I'm going to go up through Active Directory, public key infrastructure, network security monitoring, SIM, cloud, how to integrate the two, get logs from all the things. And it's going to be slowly built out in 15 minute to 60 minute video clips over the next 20 to 30 weeks. So if that's something that interests you, check that out because you shouldn't be doing your lab all at once you're gonna get burnt out, plan for it. I had one team member, fantastic gentleman, super passionate, overly passionate. He burnt himself out real quick and I had to keep, hey, slow down. Like I get that you're ramped up right now, but when you start hitting it and he was doing like 20 hours a week plus building out a lab and I was like, and you're hitting the wall and rather than trying to stop and breathe, you're just banging your head against the wall and. You shouldn't do it all at once. Do it in small increments. Actually, when you grow the most is often when you do small increments. If you're disciplined, maybe you're trying to do like 10 to 30 minutes a day. I would still say that might be too much. Like, you know, spend maybe a few hours a week. Don't do it all at once. And you went to college potentially for years. Studying for certifications is hard and it takes time. Home lab, you can actually go much deeper and get much more hands-on experience. And oddly, it's not the same time frame. Like, 
if I'm getting a Microsoft cert on Active Directory, well, it's like three different certs it's covered in and you have to study a whole bunch, maybe a week per thing. You could stand up Active Directory in like an hour from Googling it. And then when things break and you're like, I don't know why this works, you learn so much. So hopefully I've kind of shared misconceptions and why a home lab actually matters. And I, I hope you take that to heart. And I, if it helps you get a job or change your mentality, please let me know. I'd love to hear it rather than some of the other bad comments. But with that being said, let's let's move to my other half. Let's let's go to the hobby farm. And this stuff's fun. <laughs> so this this personifies to me the hobby farm life. I've got eight miniature horses. By miniature, I mean like I'm sitting in a chair, like armrest down size, they're, they're, they're tiny. Uh, miniature cows, you can see my wife scratching the chin of one of our miniature cows. Uh, we have two of those. They actually lived in our house for a few weeks when they were babies. Oh, it was so adorable. <laughs> We've got two miniature donkeys. Those are my boys there. You can see they're scratching the chins. Like there's a lot of chin scratching around here. Uh, I've got, five or six cats. You can see the one in the sink. Uh, I've got two golden retrievers and I've got a toy slash miniature dachshund who's like all of, I want to say eight pounds. Uh, the, uh, the other black dog in here, which is a Bernese mountain dog, uh, is actually my mom's who lives right on the property with me. And so we've had two baby horses. We've got about 20 chickens, uh, four guinea hens, which are those really weird looking like skin flapping <laughs> things by the chickens in the picture. Got a few rabbits, uh, two goats, and I'm, I'm probably missing something. Oh, we have four geese and we have some ponds with fish and lots of animals. So when I say hobby farm, it, it's not about like planting and growing crops uh, like a traditional farm. Hobby farm as in animals. We don't eat any of our animals. Uh, I'm a huge softy, so I just I couldn't even do it if I tried. I don't hunt. I have nothing against it. I just don't do that. Uh, we do eat eggs from the chickens and the guineas. And I can tell you, once you start having farm fresh eggs, it's really hard to do store-bought eggs. And you see me in the little go-kart with my, you can barely see my son with the little spiky hat riding with me. And uh, I've got three kids in the hobby farm. I just want to say, it has really brought our family together. Uh, and it's actually been a huge help for bringing my local community together. Like we do like a, uh, we've done junior high ministry. Uh, we've done uh, my, my daughter's Girl Scouts and we have like a bridge that goes over our pond and they've done like their bridging ceremonies there. And we have a lot of get togethers and it's just, it's like all about community and I love it. Couldn't have dreamed for anything even better. And it's interesting because my wife there, she didn't like animals when we were dating, like not even like dogs. And she's the one that wanted the cows. And now like I, I've, I've changed her to the dark side of the force. <laughs> so if I'm talking about hobby farm, I think I need to be honest about what's the, the good side of it as well as what's the bad. And so if I'm at like a SANS conference or I'm out about and folks hear about this hobby, there's always like the same kind of questions like, wow, that, uh, that seems like a lot of work. Or like even if, as soon as I mentioned like we have horses, they're like, wow, that would be cool, but I could never keep up with that. that that's just, it's just a lot. Well, it's not really as bad as you think it is. Like, Maybe a few times a year, you do have to clean poop out of the stalls, but to be honest, horses don't really wanna be in the stalls. If it's a nice day, they're out and about eating grass and moving around. So the stalls only get a bunch of poop in them, like when it's raining or storming because they wanna get out of the weather. So it's really not that bad, unless you're like doing show horses in which they're locked in the, the stall all year round. I don't do that. All of ours are out and about. That's where I want them. If you have an old fence, like when I bought the house I'm at, it was an older fence. And so occasionally like you bump into it, it's like it fall off. It's like, oh, so you'd have to go nail up with you. But uh, I've replaced the fence since then. And 
I won't have to maintain anything for a while. And I put up the white vinyl fence, so I really shouldn't have to do anything for a long time. Occasionally, animals get hurt. That vet bill can be kind of expensive. Uh, to be honest, I would actually say animals getting hurt or dying is probably one of the number one drawbacks. I'm a big softy. So like if, if you have to have an animal put down because they're, you know, just bad things happen, um, it's something you do have to deal with. Uh, my kids, my daughter, my son, have, I feel like they've grown a lot because I don't hide them from that kind of stuff. I remember being at Walmart back when they had fish. And uh, I was there with my daughter and there was another dad with, uh, I, I believe a son. And the son's like, oh, daddy, the fish is dead. And he's like, oh no, son, it's just sleeping. <laughs> I look at my daughter, I was like, he's dead. <laughs> and he just looks at me like, what's wrong with you? It's like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, my daughter's used to this, we have a far. <laughs> it's like, whoops, I ran my mouth. I should have just been quiet. Uh, and it's sad, but when you acknowledge that, like, I felt like that's helped even when like some of grandparents and stuff passed away, like they accept the grief, they acknowledge it. And again, I feel like Hobby Farm has really brought our family together. You'll have to buy some like water heaters and stuff because in the winter you can't have the water freezing. And probably what's the most kind of pain is I have to store hay once a year. So like end of summer, early fall, I have to get like two to 300 bales and get it up in our hayloft. But our hay comes directly from our land. So I don't have to buy it, it's free. Uh, and what I do is half the hay goes to a local farmer and then I get the other half in exchange for him coming with his equipment. So it's a, it's a nice little deal. And we have an electronic conveyor belt, one of those tire tile conveyor belts we bought at an auction for like 50 bucks. And so we put the hay on it and it moves it up into the hay loft and someone takes it off and it takes one day. So one day, probably, it's probably like four to six hours of work. It's hot. It's not very fun, but then you're done. So labor wise, if I actually like plot this out, and this might be mind blowing. I'm actually going to say like my golden retrievers are substantially more work than all of my horses, donkeys, cows, goats combined. How is, how is that possible, Justin? Well, because the dogs, you have to constantly let in and out of the house to go to the bathroom. They sometimes track in mud and, you know, like there's like the feeding and all like they're more work. <laughs> With horses in my farm, we feed twice a day because there's grass everywhere. And even whenever it's winter, you throw down like bales of hay and they're good for the day. So we do grain twice a day. That takes five minutes if you're in a rush, probably closer to 10, but 15 minutes is kind of the upper bound. And to be honest, I don't feed anymore. My nine-year-old daughter does it. She gets on our little golf cart and drives around. She gets up at six o'clock or 5.30 in the morning. She doesn't have to. And I didn't ask her to do this. Like I'm super proud daddy, by the way. <laughs> Like she has to be at school at 745. So she could feed at like 720, 715, 7 o'clock. But she likes getting up so early in the morning because then instead of being 10 minutes to feed, she spends time with them and pets them and loves on them. And it's like, that's cool. So I don't even feed. She does it in the morning. She does it in the evening. I'll join her every once in a while. And everything outside of that is just the family spending time with the animals which means these are more of, you can kind of let them do their thing or you spend time with them. And if you're going on vacation, well, you can front load hay, like you can do a big old round bale. You could technically, like I hire someone to just check on them just because I like to make sure all the animals are taken care of while I'm gone. But the grain is more of to get them to come up and get used to being around humans, to let us pet on them, check to make sure everybody's okay, nobody's hurt. It's not actually a requirement because think of like wild animals. What do they live off of? The land. <laughs> so, so to put the whole cost perspective, time-wise is actually very minimal. The cost, there is some cost. Like I buy $8 bags of uh, sweet grain. Technically I buy like chick food and a few other things, but I don't buy it, have to get it that often. But like for all the horses, donkeys, cows, goats, it's an $8 bag, 
one bag will last approximately six feedings. Six feedings is basically three days, right? So with eight mini horses, too many cows, too many donkeys, one full-size horse, 20 chickens, four geese, four guinea hens, two rabbits, and again, I probably left some things out. It equates to roughly $400 a month. You know, here's the technical aspect of my hobby side. <laughs> $8 per bag, six feeds, but I'm technically doing like four uh, a day because I have two different barns times 30 days, $360 a month, plus the random like chick feed, rabbit feed, stuff like that. It's about $400 a month. So $400 a month and probably 30 minutes a day is kind of the upper bounds. Now, again, I spend way more time with the animals than 30 minutes, maybe not each day, but that's because the whole reason I have them is to enjoy them. But the requirements, 10 to 30 minutes a day feeding. And even then, you don't technically have to do that. Well, all right, Justin, I feel like you're being a little conservative on the cost there, because what about like the big old tractor that, uh, you know, old McDonald had? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a tractor. I don't. Like I, my dad used to have a really old one that we'd use, but when it broke down, we didn't replace it. Because I don't need one. I don't even have a four-wheeler. <laughs> I have a really good lawnmower because I have 16 and a half acres. Uh, I probably have to mow four or five acres like around our ponds and stuff, but the rest are fenced in that the horses and animals can eat. So I, I still have a decent amount of mowing to do, but the largest cost with a hobby farm are the land and house by far. The animals themselves can be kind of expensive, like the miniature cows, that's not a very common thing. So I wanna say they were like two or three grand a cow, which was, a kind of ridiculous amount of money, but my wife really wanted them. And so happy birthday, right? And we have a golf cart. In fact, you might hear them in the background because my kids are goofing off, I can tell. And that was bought used. So we probably have all the animals in plus the golf cart. The zero turn came with the property I bought, maybe $10,000 in because some of the animals aren't that expensive, maybe 20 at the max, but that's just because I have so many miniature horses and they're a little bit more pricey, but I want to say it was closer to 10. And really, when you're factoring, like, is a hobby farm for me? Well, if you don't like animals, the answer's no. <laughs> but the total cost of ownership, I feel, I swear this is because I'm in IT and I have to maintain budgets and stuff like that, but... The total cost of ownership, if you like consider all the factors, I actually feel like being on a hobby farm is cheaper than what most of y'all are doing. What do I mean by that? Well, in order to buy land and have animals, you have to be in an area that allows, like you can't have chickens in the city. They don't allow that. It's against city ordinances or laws. So you have to find land that's usually right on the outskirts of the city. It might still be considered you know, part of the township, or you might be outside of it. Well, when you're on the outskirts or out of the country, I'm one block outside of city limits. I'm right in the middle of town, but I'm one block outside. I don't have to pay taxes, city taxes. Cha-ching, yeah, right? On top of that, because I'm in this type of area, land and housing is substantially cheaper than other places. Like even in towns, let alone cities, like, I live in roughly a 4,300 square foot house with two outdoor barns and a shed and another outbuilding. And all of that, plus, you know, the really nice house and a, a hot tub and like all these nice things, but it cost me probably less than it would cost you to live in a two bedroom apartment in the city the rest of your life. So the cost because of where you might relocate, assuming you can do like work from home and stuff like that, which is more common now than ever, could be cheaper. And building all those family memory, memories, that's priceless. There's my son sitting underneath my uplift standing desk, likes to watch his tablet and you know, smack my legs, try to get my attention. The cat here, the gray one is my three-legged tripod cat. Love that cat. My daughter's constantly in the field with the horses and I love hobby farms. So I don't know whether I persuaded it to you and if not, 
at least you got to see some cute pictures. <laughs> so, okay. We're all end. And then if there's any questions or time for questions, we'll do that. And if not, I hope you've enjoyed this, but uh, I've got a GitHub uh, specifically. I got a YouTube that's got lots of new stuff coming out and you have my contact information. If you have questions about home labs, anything IT in general, I'll talk. I love that stuff. Or if you want to talk about hobby farm and getting ideas and you're considering it, hey, reach out again, as we all are here for each other, we all get better as man, as iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another love that we'll end here unless there's any questions or time. So. And I don't know, is there any time for questions or. Yeah. So we've got about six minutes for questions. They should be occasionally flowing through in the, uh, in the Slack channel, not a whole lot, just a lot of discussion about uh, all the fun, cool things you're doing, things that mostly got answered about, you know, where we can find your uh, your lab videos and people who've never eaten goat cheese and fun things like that. <laughs> yep. Goat cheese, any of that stuff is good. Again, I don't, I don't eat my animals, so I would say they would taste better than store-bought, but I don't eat my chickens and stuff like that. <laughs> Awesome. And I'm not like John Strand with a mine shaft. Um, that'd be cool. So right, I would well, be let's... open to doing a bed and breakfast. That would be cool. And I, I seriously am planning on doing a petting zoo, like maybe like Facebook where it's only like every so many weekends uh, throughout the year. And there's one thing I really want to do that if you ever own animals, especially ones that aren't as common like horses, um, I want to do where children who have been abused physically, sexually, any way uh, that they can basically pair up with an animal, spend time with them and learn that like there's trust and there's love and life is good because uh, I just think that would be really cool. So. It's awesome. Well, thanks for your talk.